couple announcements at the top, and then uh, we'll turn to your questions. You may have seen yesterday that the CDC announced changes to their COVID-19 travel health notice system. We here at the Department of State have also reassessed how COVID-19 considerations factor into our tra travel advisory levels for U.S. citizens. Starting next week, the State Department travel advisory levels will no longer automatically correlate with the CDC COVID-19 travel health notice level. However, if the CDC raises a country to a level four for COVID-19 or if COVID-19 related restrictions threaten to strand, isolate, or otherwise seriously affect U.S. citizens, the State Department's travel advisory for that country will also be raised to a level four or do not travel. The updated framework will significantly reduce the, level, the number of level four travel advisories, and we believe it will help U.S. citizens make better informed decisions about the safety of international travel at this time. We encourage U.S. citizens planning international travel this summer or any other time to check their passport expiration date. Act now to renew or apply for the first time. Keep in mind that many countries do require passports to have at least six months remaining validity, validity for, entry, for entry. Routine passport processing, as we have uh, warned, can take eight to 11 weeks. We also encourage U.S. citizens to stay connected with us via travel.state.gov and through our at travel.gov social media accounts and to enroll in the Smart Traveler Enrollment Program or STEP to receive timely alerts about evolving health and uh, safety conditions. Uh, and finally today, the U.S. Department of State released our first ever equity action plan to implement Executive Order 13985 on advancing racial equity and support for underserved communities through the federal government. We joined over 90 federal agencies and all cabinet level agencies across the U.S. government in this launch. This plan is the product of President Biden's historic executive order directing federal agencies to address barriers to opportunity for underrepresented, underrepresented and underserved communities. Our equity action plan outlines commitments, actions and accountability mechanisms to improve our effectiveness in successfully integrating equity across our foreign affairs work. Uh, with that, happy to uh, take your questions. Daphne. Russia warned today that it would deploy nuclear weapons and hypersonic missiles in Kaliningrad if Finland and Sweden join NATO. Is the U.S. concerned about Russia upping its rhetoric around this? And then I have a question on embassy staffing as well. Uh, the warning I saw in that regard came from a uh, former uh, Russian official who was uh, no longer in power and arguably uh, may not have been in power uh, at the time he purportedly was in power. Uh, so no, we don't have a specific response to that. Uh, the Russian Federation knows uh, where we stand in terms of our commitment uh, to Article 5. Uh, the idea, the uh, sacrosanct commitment we have that uh, an attack on one is an attack on all, but we don't have a spe re specific response to that. Uh, and France said today it will very soon transfer back its embassy in Ukraine from Kyiv to Lviv. Are U.S. embassy staff still commuting from Poland to Lviv, and are there any plans to stop commuting and be fully operational in Lviv or to reopen the embassy in Kyiv? Well, uh, a number of weeks ago, uh, just before the start of the invasion, a core mission Ukraine team uh, that previously uh, was working from uh, Lviv uh, relocated uh, to Poland. They remain in Poland. They are not currently uh, traveling over the border uh, to Ukraine uh, due to the unstable uh, security situation. Uh, I will say, however, that we are constantly evaluating and reevaluating the safety and the security situation. It is, of course, our goal uh, to have a diplomatic presence reestablished in Ukraine as soon as it would be safe and practical uh, to have U.S. diplomats on the ground there. But I would also hasten to add that the lack of a U.S. diplomatic uh, presence, uh, U.S. diplomatic uh, officials in Ukraine, has in no way hampered our ability to coordinate uh, and to consult with our Ukrainian partners. In fact, uh, just today, just a few hours ago, Secretary Blinken again had an opportunity to speak over the phone uh, to Foreign Minister Kuleba. Uh, Foreign Minister Kuleba, of course, is the same Foreign Minister Kuleba that we saw last week in Brussels. It was the same Foreign Minister Kuleba that Secretary Blinken saw uh, just before that in uh, Warsaw, the same Foreign Minister Kuleba that he saw just before that uh, inside Ukraine. Uh, when we met with Foreign Minister Kaleba and his team uh, along the Polish-Ukrainian border. Uh, of course, President Biden spoke to President Zelensky yesterday. Secretary Austin routinely speaks to his uh, Ukrainian counterpart. Uh, so 
the, the point is that our engagement has uh, been consistent, it's been routine, it's been very uh, deep uh, to discuss uh, precisely the issues that are of most important to us, how we can continue to support our Ukrainian partners, uh, and how we can continue uh, to hold the Kremlin to account for its illegal war of aggression against the state and the people of Ukraine. Is there a likelihood that Secretary, uh, likelihood that Secretary uh, Blinken will go to Ukraine? I don't have any travel. Uh, a great deal of talk. I, I, don't, I don't have any travel uh, to speak to. Uh, what I would do is reiterate what I uh, just said. Secretary Blinken, uh, on very frequent occasions, uh, has the opportunity to speak to his Ukrainian counterpart. Uh, he ends up speaking to Foreign Minister Kaleba uh, roughly several times a week, uh, most weeks. And in recent weeks, uh, we've ended up seeing Foreign Minister Kaleba uh, in person as well. On, on the issue of diplomacy and diplomatic presence and so on, you spoke about diplomatic presence in Ukraine, American diplomatic presence. Can you update us on the U.S. diplomatic presence in Russia, in Moscow, and vice versa? Is there anything that is happening? Are you guys in contact with the Russians through Ambassador uh, Sullivan, or are, are, are you here in contact with Ambassador Antonov? That, that's the point of uh, our diplomatic presence in Russia and around the world, uh, to be in contact uh, with the host government. Uh, so, of course, we do uh, have a functioning embassy uh, in Moscow, Ambassador Sullivan uh, is in as our Ambassador Sullivan's uh, deputies and, and colleagues uh, in regular contact with their uh, Russian counterparts on uh, issues of bilateral uh, interest. Uh, we have spoken uh, not only in recent months but um, throughout the course of this administration uh, about the unfortunate actions that the Russian Federation has taken to limit our diplomatic presence on the ground uh, in Russia. What we seek is parity. Uh, in terms of the uh, level of diplomatic staffing that we are able to have in our embassy uh, in Russia, our embassy in Moscow, uh, and what the Russians have here in the United States. Uh, we believe that uh, the diplomatic relationship, the ability uh, to communicate clearly, effectively, and oftentimes frankly, uh, is important in all times, but it's especially important in times uh, of increased tension and in the case of uh, Russia's aggression against Ukraine in the case of conflict. Yes, Jenny. Um, the ICC prosecutor general is on the ground in Ukraine right now. I know you mentioned uh, repeatedly that the U.S. is supporting international mechanisms. Is the U.S. sharing information with the ICC on potential war crimes? And then can you just clarify, is the U.S. doing its own assessment of whether atrocities like genocide and war crimes have taken place in Ukraine? Let me start with that second question, which I appreciate because I believe there uh, is a misimpression about uh, the process that is involved here. Um, I think specifically there's a misimpression that the department would require a demand signal or an order from on high to undertake a careful review of what is transpiring on the ground in Ukraine. Uh, to be clear, there is a constant uh, demand signal, including from Secretary Blinken, uh, for insight into potential atrocities or atrocity crimes committed around the world, and as a matter of course, uh, our Office of Global Criminal Justice and their uh, colleagues, other experts from the department, are carefully reviewing all of the inputs that are available uh, to us regarding what is transpiring in Ukraine. That includes very public data points that all of us have seen uh, across our television screens that we've read uh, in newspaper, but it also includes details gleaned from intelligence reporting as well. Uh, as we've said, and this gets to the first part of your question, our priority at the moment uh, is pursuing accountability for atrocity crimes. And we're supporting the efforts of uh, various accountability me mechanisms, including the efforts of the Ukrainian Prosecutor General, whose work we have assisted since long before uh, Russia's current military campaign in Ukraine began. We've been assisting this work for the better part uh, of a decade now. Um, as you may know, and I mentioned this yesterday, uh, our ambassador at large for global criminal justice, Beth Van Skok, uh, is going to have an engagement. Uh, she's going to engage uh, virtually uh, with her uh, Ukrainian, uh, excuse me, with the Ukrainian prosecutor general, uh, who is leading uh, an effort when it comes to criminal accountability uh, for what has already uh, transpired in Ukraine. That will take place uh, tomorrow. But let me hasten to add. That same broader process, the process to collect, analyze, share, document uh, evidence of 
uh, atrocities and potential atrocity crimes is the very same one that could ultimately inform other potential atrocity crime determinations, uh, including the atrocity crime of genocide. Uh, as you know, the department has already assessed that members of Russia's forces have committed war crimes, one of uh, the three forms of atrocity crimes, uh, another uh, atrocity crime. There is, uh, just to reiterate, a constant demand signal in this building for that work uh, for a few reasons. It helps us shine a spotlight on these atrocities. It helps us bring the world together in our diplomatic campaign in support of our Ukrainian partners and in the diplomatic campaign to uh, hold Russia uh, to account and uh, to craft our public messaging, how we speak about uh, what is transpiring uh, in Ukraine. And when it comes to all of those elements, uh, we will follow the facts, we will follow the law uh, wherever they lead. Yes. So, sorry, uh, just to sorry. clarify, are you currently sharing information with the ICC given that the U.S. is not a party? So we are, in the first instance, supporting the work of the Ukrainian Prosecutor General uh, because there is a very clear uh, jurisdiction in terms of her work uh, for potentially holding uh, war criminals, in this case, accountable for the atrocity crimes uh, they have uh, committed. Uh, we are consulting very closely with allies and partners about potential other accountability mechanisms. Uh, in fact, we've helped to birth uh, at least one accountability mechanism. We, uh, as part of our re-engagement with the UN's Human Rights Council, uh, helped to establish the uh, Commission of Inquiry uh, that is now uh, focused on this as well. The OSCE and the Moscow mechanism, uh, the first report of which uh, was issued uh, yesterday, were uh, supporting. Uh, but when it comes to uh, the ICC, um, uh, we know that the ICC is one potential uh, venue for accountability. We have cooperated with the ICC in the past. I believe I mentioned this yesterday, uh, that within recent days, uh, the trial of a former John Jaweed commander uh, has begun at The Hague uh, under the auspices of the ICC. Uh, that is that individual is being tried in part uh, based upon evidence that the Department of State ourselves uh, collected for his role in the genocidal campaign that the Omar al-Bashir regime carried out uh, a number of uh, years ago. But we are consulting very closely uh, with allies and partners with an eye first and foremost uh, to the mechanisms and to the jurisdictions uh, that will help us see that ultimate goal of accountability achieved. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Price. Good opportunity for me. I have three questions. Good to see you. Number one, thank you. Number one, the Taliban uh, still continue their policy toward Afghan uh, girls not allowed to go to school. What will be the next consequence from the uh, State Department? Number two, the people who approve for SIV visa still, uh, they have some problem because they have children over uh, 21 or 22 years old. Uh, they have problem, they cannot uh, travel without their kids. And number three, the people who apply applied for the SIV visa after September 10, uh, they didn't get any response from the State Department. And also the last question, some Afghan former, sol former soldiers disappearing from the Taliban jail. Uh, nobody know where they are. Of course, some people think that uh, they get killed by the Taliban. And Afghan people think that the United States forgot Afghan people and all attention goes to the Ukraine. I don't know. Well, uh, nothing could be further from the truth, as, as you know. Uh, we have continued to stand by the people of Afghanistan uh, in terms of our humanitarian leadership uh, and the uh, contributions that we have made, including in recent days, uh, to the humanitarian needs of uh, the Afghan people, but also in terms of what we're doing diplomatically on the world stage uh, together with our allies and partners. And you raise the issue of girls' education. Uh, and the egregious decision uh, last month, March uh, 23rd, um, what was supposed to be the first day of the school year uh, for uh, school children, including girls uh, across uh, the country, uh, turned into a day of uh, horrible disappointment and uh, despair. Uh, for millions of Afghans with the Taliban's uh, very regrettable uh, decision uh, not to allow girls to return to secondary school. Uh, this, in doing so, the Taliban reversed uh, commitments that they had made uh, very publicly uh, and commitments that we had discussed with them uh, privately as well. 
uh, their decision, as I mentioned before, it was a deeply disappointing one. Uh, it was in some ways uh, a, uh, an inexplicable uh, reversal of the commitments that they had made to uh, their own people. We've made the point previously that education is not only a human right, uh, but it is indispensable uh, to the success of any particular country. Uh, holding back more than half of any country's uh, population is not a recipe for success for Afghanistan uh, or anywhere else around the world. No country can succeed economically. No country can succeed uh, politically. Uh, no country can uh, succeed on any basis uh, when half of its population or more than half of its population is unable to go to school, ultimately unable to join the, join the workforce. Uh, together with uh, our partners in the international community, uh, we have been working uh, for some time and we continue uh, to work uh, to support uh, education in Afghanistan, uh, expecting uh, that schools last month would have opened uh, for all. We have called on the Taliban uh, to overcome whatever impediments exist uh, to implementing the commitments they've made, to honor the commitments they've made uh, to uh, their own people each day that Afghanistan secondary schools remain closed uh, to girls uh, is another missed day of school, another uh, missed opportunity, uh, not only for the girls uh, of Afghanistan, but uh, for the people and the country uh, of Afghanistan. Uh, the secretary, the deputy secretary, Tom West, our special uh, representative for Afghanistan, our special envoy for Afghan women, girls, and human rights, Rina Amiri, uh, our charge d'affaires, uh, who's now based uh, in Doha, uh, they have all uh, decried this decision on the part of uh, the Taliban. Uh, we've also done so in coordination with many of our close partners around the world. Uh, shortly after the Taliban announced uh, this decision, uh, we released a joint statement with uh, our counterparts in Canada, in France, Germany, Italy, Japan, Norway, the UK, uh, and the High Representative of uh, the European Union, all condemning the decision on the part of the Taliban uh, not to reopen uh, secondary schools. The Organization uh, of, of Islamic Cooperation uh, similarly put out uh, a statement, uh, as well as uh, female foreign ministers uh, from 16, at least 16 countries uh, around the world, from uh, Albania to Tonga and the UK. Uh, this was a topic of discussion during the extended troika uh, that Tom West uh, attended late last month in Tunchi, uh, China. Uh, and we have been very clear uh, that if this decision uh, is not reversed, and if it's not reversed uh, promptly, it will hold uh, significant, uh, serious implications uh, for our ability uh, to engage with uh, the Taliban and the Taliban's desire uh, to have better relations, not only with the United States, uh, but with the international community. Uh, yes. On Taiwan, uh, several U.S. senators arrived to Taiwan today. Um, was uh, do you have anything on that first? And first of all, and then second of all, was the State Department given a heads up before their visit? What is the message U.S. is sending to Taiwan and China? Thank you. Uh, I don't have a comment on uh, the congressional delegation. I would need to refer you to the members of Congress. The State Department does uh, assist members of Congress uh, as, a, as a routine matter, uh, oftentimes when they travel overseas. Uh, but for comment on uh, this particular visit, I would need to refer you to those members' site. And also, I thought earlier in April, uh, Deputy Secretary McKeon met with the WHO uh, Director General, and Taiwan's participation of WHO it was discussed, how hopeful is the United States that Taiwan will be uh, invited as an observer to the World Health Assembly in May? Thank you. Well, it's something that uh, we support, that we have consistently supported. We believe that uh, Taiwan, consistent with its status, uh, should have meaningful participation in international organizations. Uh, so it's something that we'll continue to support, Said. Thank you. I have a couple of questions on the Palestinian issue. First of all, I want to note uh, that the Palestinian uh, Affairs Unit Chief, uh, George Noll, spoke to the family of uh, Gareth Sabteen yesterday to express uh, your condolences to the family and demand investigations. Does that mean there is a, a marked change? I mean, you've done, never done that before. There's, we have evidence that this was 
done in a cold-blooded fashion, for instance. And she was a mother of five. She was partially blind and so on. I don't have any uh, additional information for you on that. As you know, uh, our officials on the ground uh, do often engage uh, with Israelis, with uh, Palestinians, but I don't have anything to read out from uh, any particular engagement. Okay. Uh, I have two other questions. Uh, the, the Israeli Times of Israel uh, newspaper reported that the U.S. aims to pull Palestinians into an expanded cooperation between Israel and Arab state. How do you envision this happening? Well, uh, Said, you saw the um, Negev uh, ministerial uh, that Secretary Blinken attended with uh, several of his counterparts uh, from uh, Israel uh, and the Arab world. And there was a focus during the course of that uh, ministerial on, of course, the Abraham Accords and the normalization agreements that have brought uh, built bridges and uh, brought new opportunities for Israelis and, and Arabs uh, alike, with normalization becoming in some ways uh, the new normal uh, and the opportunities that uh, come with that. But what we heard uh, during the uh, ministerial itself uh, and what you heard uh, during the um, uh, press availability that the ministers uh, participated in uh, was a recognition on the part of Secretary Blinken, on the part of uh, uh, others, that uh, normalization can't be a substitute for progress uh, between Israelis and Palestinians. Uh, and so as Israel and its Arab neighbors enjoy additional opportunities owing to the progress that uh, normal normalization is uh, bringing with it, there was a concerted desire on the part of Secretary Blinken, on the part of his Arab counterparts, on the part of uh, Foreign Minister uh, Lapid of Israel. Uh, to s do what we can across uh, several different areas, the working groups that are emanating from uh, the Negev Forum, uh, to achieve progress uh, when it comes to um, uh, conditions for uh, the Palestinian people. And uh, my last question regarding the human rights report, I mean the human rights report that was issued a couple of days ago, it talks extensively about the West Bank and Israel and so on. My question pertains to the six human rights organizations uh, that were listed as terrorist organizations. They have they, they issued an appeal to, to you, to, to uh, Europeans and so on, uh, to follow through. I mean, you, you were investigating this. You, you, I guess, requested the Israelis to supply you with why they listed them to begin with. And that was back in October. Where do we stand? Have you gotten a satisfactory response from the Israelis? Do you believe that these organizations should be or should remain listed as terrorist organizations? Well, we have received uh, detailed information on that very question from our Israeli partners, uh, and it's something that we're continuing to review. But uh, is, is, is their response satisfactory as far as you're concerned? We've received. They have committed such a grievous uh, act to require en enlisted or being enlisted on the terror organization. We've received detailed information uh, from our Israeli partners on the basis uh, for their designation. We're taking a very close look at that ourselves. Michelle. Uh, do you have any update on the talks with Iran? Any, uh, any uh, new session in Vienna soon? And uh, did the U.S. Um, freeze any uh, money for Iran? Or do you know of uh, any of uh, your allies that uh, unfrozen any amount? Uh, all of our sanctions uh, remain in effect, and all of our sanctions will remain in effect until and unless uh, we're able to uh, achieve a mutual return to compliance uh, with the JCPOA. It's been very unfortunate uh, to see a number of stories that are false, that are completely untrue, not only on the questions of sanctions, uh, or reported sanctions relief, I should say, uh, but the related question or the way it's been uh, conflated of false claims of a detainee deal. Um, the fact is, uh, unfortunately, uh, we don't have uh, any breakthrough to announce. Uh, any information relating to uh, our negotiations regarding wrongful detainees, uh, Americans who were held uh, wrongfully in Iran, would come directly uh, from uh, the State Department. Uh, we know there's been a lot of uh, false information out there. We urge everyone uh, to exercise caution uh, with uh, these reports. Uh, but the fact is now that uh, there are two parallel uh, tracks uh, that are 
uh, underway with Iran. One, as we've talked about in the context of Vienna uh, for a mutual return to full implementation of the JCPOA, uh, and one on the release of all four uh, U.S. citizens who are unjustly uh, held in Iran. Uh, unfortunately, at this stage, neither of uh, these negotiations has been successfully concluded. Uh, any reports otherwise, uh, including, as you referred to, Michelle, reports that uh, Iranian funds held in restricted accounts in third countries would be transferred uh, are false, and our partners have not released uh, these restricted funds to Iran, nor has the United States authorized or approved uh, any such transfer of restricted funds uh, to Iran. Uh, we are continuing to approach both of these negotiations with the utmost urgency. Uh, we urge Iran to do the same. Uh, we urge Iran uh, to allow U.S. citizens Bakr and Siamak Namazi, Ahmad Shargi, and Murad Tabaz uh, to, re to return home to their loved ones. Yes. Thank you so much. This is Jahan Zaybali from Airway News TV Pakistan. Pakistani newly elected Prime Minister Shehbaz Sharif has said that he wants better relations with the United States uh, to promote shared goals of uh, peace, security, and development in the region. Does the U.S. see his election of PM Sharif as an uh, opportunity to uh, improve the bilateral relations with Pakistan? Well, you probably saw a statement that uh, we released from the Secretary uh, last night regarding uh, the selection of uh, Prime Minister Shabazz Sharif. Uh, for almost uh, 75 years, uh, the relationship between the United States and Pakistan has been a vital one. Uh, we look forward to continuing that work with uh, Pakistan's government to promote peace and prosperity uh, in Pakistan and the broader uh, region. And in that spirit, we've congratulated uh, Prime Minister Shabazz Sharif on his election uh, by the Pakistani uh, parliament. And we look forward to working uh, with him and his government. The former Prime Minister of Pakistan, Imran Khan, still blaming U.S. for his ouster while his supporters are organizing anti-U.S. protests here in America, like in different states. Yesterday, D.C., uh, his uh, supporters attacked on Pakistani American journalists and a uh, few community members who disagree with them. So do you have any message for them who are uh, organizing anti-U.S. protests here in America, even oh. when you rejected all those claims and White House also rejected all those claims? Our, our message has been clear and consistent on this. There is no truth whatsoever to the allegations that uh, have been put forward. Uh, we support the peaceful upholding of constitutional and democratic principles, uh, including respect for human rights. Uh, we do not support, whether it's in Pakistan or anywhere else around the world, uh, one political party over another. Uh, we support broader principles, including uh, the rule of law and equal justice under the law. So one last question, if you allow me, please. So uh, today, the Pakistan Pakistan's military spokesperson said that they had no evidence to suggest that the United States had threatened or was involved in the conspiracy to seek the ouster of Imran Khan's government. Your thoughts and comment on this statement? Uh, we would agree with it. Thanks. Natik Nailoglu from Azerbaijan, Real TV. Uh, uh, my question is, uh, when will the 907 amend, uh, uh, amendment uh, to the Freedom um, Support Act be lifted from Azerbaijan? Well, we uh, remain committed to promoting a peaceful, democratic, and prosperous future for the South Caucasus region. Uh, and we welcome, uh, as you've heard from us before in uh, the readouts uh, from Secretary Blinken, the April 6th meeting uh, between Prime Minister Pashinyan and President Aliyev in Brussels, uh, including the positive momentum on preparations for peace talks and the formation of a bilateral commission on border delimitation. Uh, as the Secretary emphasized in the calls he had with those uh, two leaders the day before on April 5th, uh, we continue to encourage further peace negotiations between Armenia and Azerbaijan uh, and we reiterated, and the Secretary reiterated, that the United States stands ready uh, to engage bilaterally and with like-minded uh, partners, including through the role as an OSCE Minsk Group co-chair, uh, to help the countries find a long-term comprehensive peace. Yes, Thank you. Sure. Uh, there was a phone call between um, uh, Deputy Secretary Sherman and her French colleague yesterday, in which she discussed the South Caucasus Nagorno-Karabakh issue. Now, we have Lavrov a couple of days ago complaining that U.S. and France are not informing us about what they are doing. Are you guys deliberately shutting the door to Russia's mediation efforts? And given everything Russia has done in Ukraine, do you think that doesn't that disqualify Russia in 
peacemaking efforts between Azerbaijan and Armenia? Uh, I can't speak to the role uh, that Russia might play in this, but what I can say is that uh, we stand ready to engage uh, Armenia and Azerbaijan, again, bilaterally, uh, or with like-minded partners, including through uh, the OSCE mechanism. And, and, and one more question about OSCE report that you mentioned earlier. So there are details that Russia has been using OSCE symbols to do what it has been doing. Does it bother you at all? Uh, is Russia going to be suspended from the OSCE if they continue doing that? I would have to refer you to the OSCE. They put out the Moscow mechanism under the auspices of the OSCE, put out a comprehensive report uh, yesterday uh, regarding uh, the atrocities, the potential war crimes uh, that, according to the Moscow mechanism, uh, the Russians, Russia's forces have committed uh, in uh, Ukraine. But I would need to refer you to the OSCE to speak to the particulars. Connor. Staying on Ukraine, um, pro-Russian uh, social media accounts published what appears to be the U.S. passport of an American citizen named Joseph Ward Clark, claiming that he was uh, captured or killed. Uh, can you confirm whether or not that's the case? Uh, I cannot confirm that because reports that this U.S. citizen was captured in, U in Ukraine are not true. I uh, can't uh, offer anything further uh, due to privacy considerations, but uh, those reports and those claims are not true. So are you saying that um, he wasn't captured, but is the possibility that he was killed or is, uh, is yeah. entirely false? The, I, I'm limited in how much I can say due to privacy considerations, but I uh, uh, have reason to believe that this individual is safe. Is safe, great. Yep. And then um, to follow up on Jenny's questions, just on the meeting tomorrow that, that's happening between Ambassador Vanshok and the Ukrainian Prosecutor General, uh, are you, is the U.S. providing intelligence to her office beyond just sort of cooperating in, in any financial support you're offering? Are you sharing intelligence on what you know about potential atrocities? So to the point earlier, we are pulling every lever, lever that's available to us to garner insight into what has transpired uh, on the ground in Ukraine, what Russia's forces have uh, committed in terms of atrocity and atrocity crimes. Uh, we are looking at open source information, that is to say, uh, what all of us are seeing with our own eyes and reading uh, with our own eyes, but also uh, we have the advantage of uh, the resources of the U.S. intelligence community and the intelligence sharing relationships uh, that we have around the world. And as you might imagine, there is quite a bit of focus uh, trained on uh, this very question. I'm not going to get into the specific type of information that Ambassador Van Skok uh, may or may not share with her count with the Ukrainian Prosecutor General uh, tomorrow. But what I can say is that we are providing our Ukrainian partners uh, with a range of information, uh, strategic information, tactical information, uh, information that they would need uh, for the purposes of uh, primarily self-defense. So not, not on the ship Moscow. Sorry, sorry. I'm sorry. So not for. for documenting atrocities. It's it's more for the battlefield. I, I'm just not in a position to uh, detail specifically uh, what Ambassador Van Skok uh, may provide in that regard. But uh, when it comes to uh, our work here at the department, we are taking a close look uh, at everything that is available to us. Uh, and our goal and what we are doing is documenting, uh, analyzing, preserving, and yes, uh, sharing that evidence. And in the first instance, we're sharing it with Ukrainian Prosecutor General. And just one more on this then. Uh, Ambassador Van Schock, Van Schock and Ambassador Carpenter have both said that all options are on the table, uh, including in terms of the, the question that Jenny had about the ICC. But does that include the U.S., this administration, potentially joining the ICC and signing the Rome Statute, or is that out of the question? I don't believe that is uh, what's being referenced here. What's being referenced here is the ICC is a, is a potential venue for accountability for Russian war criminals. Yes. I wanted to... Uh, uh, from Macedonian Information Agency. I, I have just a couple of questions, a quick, uh, uh, it's, on a, it's about the EU integration process in the Western Balkans. You know, uh, we know actually uh, that uh, Bulgaria is uh, blocking the process uh, two years now, almost two years now, by uh, vetoing uh, North Macedonia's, uh, North Macedonia's uh, uh, opening of the accession talks with the EU. So my question is, uh, <clears throat> uh, is are U.S. Uh, supporting process, the process to be untied because Albania, uh, Albanian Prime Minister recently met with, uh, with the German uh, uh, Chancellor and uh, they said that, I guess Albanian minister, uh, Prime Minister said that they might uh, start the negotiation process uh, uh, with, uh, with the EU uh, besides uh, Macedonia and uh, Macedonia to be left behind, uh, <coughs> blocked, <coughs> excuse me, blocked by Bulgaria. So this is my first question. The, the, the second question is, uh, what is the United States doing to convince Bulgaria to uh, lift its veto on North Macedonia? 
uh, opening to, to open the, the accession talks with the EU, <coughs> having in mind the widespread Russian influence on the Balkans? Uh, thank you. So for these questions, I would need to refer you to the countries in question and to the EU. Uh, we have uh, bilateral partnerships with all of the countries uh, in question as well as with uh, the EU, but uh, those countries are best positioned to, uh, to speak to it. Yes. On North Korea, uh, first is uh, uh, the U.S. Treasury imposed another sanction on North Korea today. But yesterday, uh, the uh, North Korean regime opened a luxury housing complex in Pyongyang. So, do you see uh, this as uh, evidence that there are um, many loopholes in North Korean sanctions enough to uh, that North Koreans can build uh, luxury houses in, in their capital? And and my second question is uh, the. Uh, department announced that special representative for DPRK Ambassador Sung Kim and the deputy representative Dr. Jung Bak will travel to Seoul. And so, can you share uh, about how they will address the concerns that North Korea um, can uh, test another ICBM or resume nuclear tests soon? Uh, so on your on the second part of your question, we did announce today that uh, Sung Kim, our special envoy for the DPRK. Uh, and his deputy, Dr. Jung, Jung Pak, uh, will travel to uh, Seoul later this month. Uh, they don't leave for uh, several days. They'll be there from April 18th uh, through the 22nd. Uh, and during this trip, they'll have an opportunity uh, to meet with uh, their counterparts, other senior ROK officials, uh, to discuss the situation on the Korean Peninsula, uh, including the international community's response to uh, the recent ICBM uh, launches. Uh, this is part of a regular engagement that uh, our special envoy has with his uh, South Korean counterparts. It's also part of the regular engagement uh, and similar to the regular engagement that he has with our Japanese uh, counterparts as well. And uh, if I'm not mistaken, the special envoy uh, had a phone conversation with his Japanese counterpart uh, just yesterday because we believe in the indispensability uh, of working closely in the first instance with our uh, Japanese and South Korean uh, allies on the challenge posed by North Korea's ballistic missile and nuclear weapons uh, program, but also trilaterally. And we have had recent opportunity uh, to engage trilaterally uh, with uh, these two important allies, including with Secretary Blinken, met with his counterparts in Honolulu uh, late last year to discuss uh, the DPRK. Uh, to your question about uh, reports of uh, potential planning on the part of the DPRK, uh, I'm not in a position to uh, speak to uh, those reports to confirm uh, or to speak to any intelligence. But what I can say uh, and what we know is that uh, the DPRK in the past uh, has, uh, on, uh, has used the uh, occasion uh, of um, uh, holidays uh, and other notable occasions uh, within uh, uh, the DPRK uh, to engage in provocations. Uh, so of course, we're uh, closely uh, watching for that possibility. Can yes. Sure. Um, when uh, Ambassador Song Kim is in uh, South Korea, is he planning to meet DPRK officials in the region? I, I'm not aware of any plans to meet DPRK officials. He's there to meet with his South Korean counterparts. Thank you. Yes. Uh, I want to follow up on an earlier question. Is there any change in how the U.S. views Finland and Sweden potentially joining NATO given Russia's threat today? Uh, there is no change because we believe that NATO's open door is an open door. Uh, and it is up to the NATO alliance to determine, and only the NATO alliance, uh, to determine what its membership uh, looks like. Uh, as you know, there are there is a, a set of criteria um, that any aspirant country would need to satisfy, would need to uh, answer for uh, before it would be in a position to join the alliance. Uh, that ultimately is a question for that aspirant country uh, and NATO's 30 uh, allied members. Uh, sure. Discussions going on between Finland and Sweden and state about providing any sort of security in an interim period between application and accession to NATO? Well, this is something that the NATO Secretary General uh, spoke to when we were in Brussels uh, last week. Uh, he said uh, when he was asked, uh, quote, I'm certain that we will find ways to address concerns they may have regarding the period between the potential application and the final ratifications. I'd refer you to his comments so no on that. No plans for any bilateral 
like security agreements or anything between the U.S. and either of those We countries. We have uh, – Sweden and Finland are already close NATO partners. Of course, they are uh, close partners bilaterally of the United States uh, as well, but I don't have anything to add beyond what the Secretary General said. Daphne. Uh, if I could follow up as well, regardless of Medvedev's comments, and he's still quite close to Putin, but the Kremlin has also described this as something that would not bring stability to Europe. Is the United States concerned that Sweden and Finland addition to NATO could prompt Russia to escalate? Without speaking to any countries in particular, we would not be concerned that the expansion of a defensive alliance uh, would do anything other than promote uh, stability on uh, the European uh, continent. Now, of course, any aspirant country is, would have to meet uh, the criteria that's spelled out uh, in NATO's charter, uh, would have to receive uh, consent from the alliance itself. But again, NATO is a defensive uh, alliance uh, that is there to defend and to fortify. Uh, and NATO would not be a threat to anyone who is not attacking NATO. Yeah, can you comment on the ship, the battleship, the Russian battleship Moscow, that was allegedly struck by a Ukrainian missile? Or do you have any other information that you could share with us? I don't have any information beyond what you've heard from the Department of Defense. The Department of Defense, as I understand it this morning, confirmed that there appears to have been an explosion on board, uh, but I don't have any further details to, to offer. C can I ask you a sure. question on the genocide aspect? Do you think that in the long term, the frequent use or the repeated use of terms like war crimes or genocide would vitiate you know, the enormity of such a, a thing? You know, like uh, when, when one talks about genocide, Rwanda comes to mind. or something that are really horrendous. Do you believe that keep repeating this thing, you know, as, as we have seen in the last few days, ultimately is not good in, in terms of the, listen the enormity of such events? Said, we've repeated the, the term war crimes because Russia's forces are committing war crimes in Ukraine. Uh, that is the assessment of this department, that Russia's forces uh, have engaged in war crimes. Uh, I think that it underscores uh, the atrocities and the level of atrocities, the scale and the scope of atrocities uh, that are uh, being committed. And as a, uh, as a general point, uh, I think your, uh, your point is well taken, uh, but there is nothing routine, there is nothing general uh, about what all of us are seeing and have seen with our own eyes, uh, the level of brutality, the level of atrocity uh, that Russia's forces have engaged in uh, against the Ukrainian people inside sovereign Ukrainian territory. On Ukraine and Russia, sure. uh, Foreign Minister Kueba uh, tweeted that he discussed further sanctions with uh, Secretary Blinken today. Should we expect them this week? And also related uh, to today's announcement on Office of Sanctions Coordination, which is a new office at the State Department, will the office coordinate efforts between the agencies here, or is it about coordination between allies and partners like, for instance, immediate neighbors to Russia, Azerbaijan, Armenia, and Georgia, I don't think they have clear understanding of what is allowed, to, you know, what they are allowed to do, what they are not allowed to do. So that'll be a key key charge of uh, Ambassador Jim O'Brien, uh, who is the head of that new office uh, at the Department of State. I uh, hope many of you saw the announcement this morning that uh, Jim O'Brien, who was confirmed by the Senate last week, is now hard at work uh, in his new role uh, this week. Uh, he will work uh, throughout this building. He will work with the interagency uh, throughout the administration, but he'll also work with allies and partners uh, to ensure that our, our approach uh, to sanctions, the implementation uh, of sanctions, the development uh, of sanctions, um, specific ones and sanctions authorities uh, are coordinated uh, and implemented uh, effectively uh, with allies and partners uh, around the world. Remind me of your first question. It's about the new sanctions package. Oh, um, the, we have previously made the point that as long as Russia uh, continues to escalate uh, its actions against uh, the people of Ukraine uh, until and unless its brutality comes to an end, uh, we will continue to escalate our measures, uh, and that would include uh, additional financial and economic uh, measures against uh, the Russian Federation. Connor. On sanctions, as Russian forces now prepare for this uh, offensive in the east and in the south, is there any sense of urgency to apply new sanctions to, uh, you know, provide obviously this new $800 million tranche of, of weaponry? Uh, in order to, to try to stop this offensive from ha even happening in the first place? Well, uh, Connor, I think the what is true, and you've heard this from our Department of Defense uh, counterparts, is that uh, the Russians have 
quite a bit of firepower, uh, in part because they've been defeated uh, in the Battle of Kiev, a battle that uh, senior Russian officials apparently thought that they would be able to uh, win within a couple days uh, of initiating it in February. Uh, we're now some six weeks into this conflict, uh, and Russian forces have been repelled uh, from Kiev and are now repositioning uh, to the south and the east uh, to begin what we believe to be a concerted campaign uh, against those areas. So what we are doing uh, in the face of uh, this shifting uh, tide of battle is providing our Ukrainian partners uh, precisely this, the level and uh, the particulars of the security assistance that they have requested and that they would need to defend themselves from the campaign that the Russian Federation uh, plans to undertake, we believe. Uh, that is one element of the equation. The other element of the equation uh, is to continue with the pressure on the Kremlin. Uh, and that pressure primarily has taken the form of financial sanctions, other economic measures that by just about any metric uh, have had a profound effect on Russia's economy, on Russia's financial system, uh, on Russia's uh, positioning in the world. Uh, you take a look at uh, the economic toll of this. Uh, and because of uh, the coordinated uh, sanctions and other economic measures, Russia's economy is contracted by, is uh, forecast by most estimates to contract uh, by some 15% uh, over the course of this year. Some 30 years of economic integration have been wiped out uh, in the course of the past uh, five or six weeks. Uh, 600 companies, uh, multinational companies, have already been forced, uh, have already chosen uh, to leave the Russian marketplace. Uh, that the pinch, the hurt of that, uh, will only compound over time as inventories uh, continue to be uh, depleted with uh, nothing there to uh, replenish them. Uh, inflation is at some 15 percent. Uh, the Russian Federation, the Kremlin, has been forced to employ uh, draconian and drastic measures uh, to artificially prop up uh, its ruble and to keep its stock market uh, afloat uh, artificially. Uh, so Putin uh, has been, uh, is facing a strategic defeat on the military front, on the economic front, uh, as we've just talked about. Politically, uh, President Putin is uh, a pariah. His country is isolated uh, diplomatically. You can measure that in terms of the votes we've seen uh, at the UN, of the condemnation that is raining down uh, on Russia from all corners of the globe. His cronies uh, face international sanction. Their assets are uh, being seized. Uh, they're not able to uh, travel, but also strategically. And you take a look at the strategic implications of what has already been born uh, by the Kremlin. Uh, Putin, I think, and this goes to the question we were just discussing about NATO, um, but the fact is, uh, as the Secretary likes to say, that uh, President Putin has precipitated just about everything uh, he has sought to prevent. Uh, that, has course, that, of course, has been the case uh, during the, uh, this invasion of Ukraine, but this goes back over the course of the better part of a decade, uh, starting in 2014, uh, when the European Re uh, Reassurance Initiative began, uh, when the United States um, began to uh, increase our investments in the European continent. Uh, NATO is more united, more determined, uh, more purposeful uh, than it has been really since any time uh, since the end uh, of the Cold War. And President Putin faces an international community that is arrayed against him in a way that it never uh, has been before. So whenever this ends, however this ends, uh, Russia, we already know, uh, will be weaker, it will be enfeebled, uh, it will uh, have endured a strategic uh, defeat. And we can already see elements of that, the military elements, the political elements, the economic elements, uh, but also the strategic elements. But it doesn't seem to be stopping this coming offensive now. And my question is, is there anything economically, in terms of the sanctions, that you were preparing that you think could have that effect, or you think this offensive is going ahead either way. When President Putin made the decision to go into Ukraine, uh, he did so uh, knowing, because we were very vocal, um, both in, in public and in private, uh, about the severe consequences that would befall his economy, his financial system, his government, uh, were he to make that choice. Uh, President Putin has prioritized this military campaign in Ukraine 
uh, over just about everything else in Russian society. Uh, so what we're focused on now is providing our Ukrainian partners with the security assistance, the level uh, and uh, the specifics of precisely what they will need to continue defending themselves effectively uh, and doing uh, together with our partners and allies everything we can uh, to further diminish uh, the economic, the political, the strategic standing uh, of the Russian Federation. We've already uh, done that to good effect. A uh, final question or so, um, Jenny. Given that a number of officials in this administration have said this next phase of the conflict could be months and months long, uh, what conversations is the State Department having about sustaining this high level of support over the course of many months, um, given there could even be like supply chain issues, for example, or just logistical problems? How are, how are you planning around that? So. We have been, I think, uh, heartened, uh, if not at all surprised, uh, by uh, the level of consensus and, and near unanimity uh, in the international community. And really what is at the core uh, of that consensus, uh, number one, uh, the efforts that uh, the United States has put into this, uh, not over the course of the past six weeks, but almost over the course of six months now. Uh, this was a campaign that started for us uh, last year uh, even then, it was a campaign that was built on uh, the first year of this administration uh, that was predicated on uh, rebuilding, on repairing, on revitalizing uh, the systems of alliances and partnerships, those very systems of alliances and partnerships uh, that have been so very critical uh, to our ability to stand up uh, to Russia and to stand for uh, what our Ukrainian partners uh, are fighting to defend. Um, I think the world has continued to be shocked uh, by the level of atrocity, the level of violence, the level of brutality uh, that Russia's forces have uh, engaged in against the Ukrainian people. Uh, I think that will necessarily maintain this level of consensus uh, within the international community. We've had an occasion, uh, several occasions, to gather in Brussels, uh, in other parts of the world, uh, with our key allies and partners uh, who are with us on this, whether that's NATO, whether that's the European Union, whether that's the G7, whether it's our uh, partners in the Indo-Pacific, uh, who of course uh, have been uh, a key element. Uh, and there is no sense uh, that these countries are um, preparing to move on, uh, to look the other way. Uh, and in fact, uh, every time we gather, uh, there is renewed uh, there is uh, renewed condemnation, uh, there is renewed determination uh, to continue to see to it uh, that our Ukrainian partners uh, have what they need. Now, there are practical challenges that uh, come with this, uh, supply chains, supplies, uh, other elements of it. Those are things that we are working through, but at a political level, at a strategic level, uh, there's been no indication that we've seen uh, that the focus, the determination, the perseverance uh, will diminish over time. Thank you all very much.